Turning to the geopolitical landscape, Amir, um, for those in the room, what is GCC? And will it drift into irrelevance, as some commentators have, have mentioned? And then thinking about the business impacts, you know, how, how might that impact companies that are investing, let's say, in the e-commerce space that are banking on having a GCC customs union to be able to move goods freely around the region? So start with the easy answers. It's a Gulf Cooperation Council. And it, it's comprised of the six states, or six states that are in the, are on the Arabian Peninsula, or the Al Jazeera Al Arabiya, the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and, and thanks for that question, because I think it's important when we talk about the Middle East to you know, explain what we mean by this uh, term, the Middle East. Right? Because really what we're doing is combining a number of countries and a number of clusters uh, which have some things in common and in some ways are quite different. So by no means is it a monolith. So we call it a sharq al-awsat, the Middle East. Right? But if you, if you look at it from a more nuanced uh, perspective, starting from what's closest to us, you have al-Maghrib, right? so the countries of West Africa, uh, where you'll have Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya. Uh, and they have their own uh, dialects, they have their own culture, they have their own food, they have their own experiences with colonialism, be it from France or from Italy. So that has a certain historical context and, and sort of Maghribis understand Maghribis. And that's, uh, that's part of the Middle East. Right? And then we move to Egypt, and you had asked uh, Alexis about Egypt, and it's an it's immensely important economy. Uh, but it's a region to itself, about 100 million people, uh, which is roughly twice that of the GCC in terms of population, and three times that of Saudi Arabia. So if you're a consumer business, you need to understand Egypt, you need to know Egypt, and, and Egypt is, uh, is a very important, uh, uh, as the Egyptians say, Umm uh, dunya the mother of the world. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a great and, and ancient civilization, so it has a role to play, uh, and it has its own dynamics which we can speak about both from a commercial and from an investment perspective. Uh, and then before we come to the Gulf, we'll keep going uh, to Bilad al-Sham, right? So you've got Jordan, uh, Palestine, Israel, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, right? So these countries, again, they have they, their own dialects, their own culture, their own music, their own uh, way of interacting, their own cuisine. Uh, and uh, so the, you know, shammies, the shammies are the shammies, and, and there's a certain dynamic there. Um, and so that's important because, again, as we look at each country on its own, uh, they have their different dynamics, but there are these clusters that matter. Finally, coming to your question about the GCC, the Majlis uh, al which is the uh, six countries of the Arabian Peninsula, there's also Yemen, which is geographically located on the Arabian Peninsula, not a member of the GCC for, for reasons uh, that, John, you, your commentary uh, speaks to uh, in terms of why when the, when the GCC was formed in 1982 or 83, uh, it was uh, not invited to be a member uh, of the GCC. Uh, so in any case, uh, your question about does the GCC matter as a cluster? So certainly they're, part of the business case for the GCC is the common market and the idea that you achieve scale. So the, the only market that has substantial population within the GCC by, on a standalone basis is Saudi Arabia. And that's the country that's come up most frequently in our discussion so far. Uh, other countries in the GCC, the UAE, uh, um, Qatar, Bahrain, uh, Kuwait, uh, uh, Oman, although Oman has its own dynamics and its own historical uh, trade flows, uh, they very much benefit from being part of the GCC. Uh, the GCC does exist. Uh, there are the issues with Qatar have already been identified uh, and they're very substantial. And in fact, what we're seeing is that as countries develop their strategy, or sorry, companies develop their strategies for the Middle East, they're becoming much more nuanced. So whereas previously you may have had a GCC or a Gulf strategy, now you have to be more specific in your country level strategies. Uh, there needs to be a, a strategy for Saudi Arabia. Uh, if you're a defense contractor, you want to be active in Qatar, uh, just as you're active in Saudi Arabia. So you need to find a way to navigate uh, that uh, those dynamics. Uh, and uh, so what we're seeing is that, that companies that are already in the region are adopting a more nuanced view uh, to the GCC and to the region as a whole. And companies that are not yet in the region but looking to it as a growth opportunity are being more selective about how they enter, with whom they enter, and how they manage it. The other thing I would say from a corporate perspective is that uh, multinational corporations are expecting quicker payoffs 
now from their investments in the Middle East. So whereas e earlier, certainly the beginning of, of uh, this uh, uh, century, um, uh, the early 2000s, when you had very high oil prices and they kept going up and there was no gravity to them and you had massive surpluses, the idea was get into the Middle East, invest there, it's prosperous, it's growing. <laughs> now uh, companies are saying, I'm, I could go to the Middle East and there's certainly uh, specific propositions I can pursue, but I want to see a payback period. I want to see this business sustain itself and I want to see it grow. And there's certainly a lot of good, very viable strategies for the Middle East, but it has to be uh, specific and nuanced. Thank you. Um, thinking about some of the geological uh, prowess that underpins this part of the world, um, Jason, you know, there can be calls for things like U.S. energy independence or um, you know, weaning off a dependence of foreign oil and that that would somehow you know, cast the Middle East to hell in a handbasket. Um, but certainly what we're seeing are you know, significant shifts with regard to China, Japan, and South Korea being the world's largest importers of LNG. Um, I think watching the way in which China has now made long-term contracts with Qatar, which is kind of going against the typical contract rules um, and forging these longer-term contracts. Um, I think we're seeing the, the replication of not just energy companies, but also technology companies, Huawei being the first company to get 100% foreign ownership in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, where do you see the long-term uh, interplay between East Asia and growing and emerging Asia and the Middle East? And does that have the capacity to really cement ties in a way in which the Middle East probably did look to advanced economies and did look to the United States uh, for strategic partnerships? Yeah, there's a lot in that question, in that in that insightful commentary and question. Uh, certainly, the most rapidly growing uh, region of the world for energy demand. You look at China, India, Southeast Asia, uh, and they have an interest in securing energy supplies, affordable energy supplies, diversified energy supplies, um, including from the United States, which recently hit three million barrels a day of oil exports. Sort of a stunning number. Uh, although that has been sharply cut back now, uh, including our natural gas exports, because we've had retaliatory tariffs <laughs> imposed by uh, China on the gas uh, on the gas side. Um, so that's a that's a really important market for Middle East uh, producers, uh, uh, oil exporters, um, natural gas uh, as well, which uh, is a really interesting dynamic. The gas market. Very, is very different from the oil market, even though they get lumped together. It's undergoing historic and, and, and really, really historic and rapid transformation. Uh, natural gas typically had been, you know, up, moved by pipeline, much harder to transport than oil, connecting, connecting point A and point B, uh, unique geopolitical uh, uh, leverage points that arise as a result, and now we're seeing gas take to the water, be moved by LNG tanker, much more flexibility in where it comes from and where it goes, and gradually the global gas market is starting to function like an integrated gas market, and, and, and that's a good thing from a security of supply and a competitiveness standpoint. It means that price signals can work, and post-Fukushima, when demand for uh, uh, gas and, and energy imports goes through the roof, high prices can pull those supplies in from, from elsewhere in the world. Um, I think the extent to which, and the, and the U.S. is going to be one of those important suppliers. Uh, now, we have LNG imports as well as exports in the Middle East, and sort of geopolitics plays a really interesting role when you look at where the gas is being produced and exported and where it's being imported. The places that would make the most natural sense don't always work because of different geopolitical tensions that exist between uh, countries that are right next door to one another. Um, but uh, the point I would make is I think the extent to which suddenly because the U.S. is the largest oil producer in the world, a stunning turnaround from where we were just a decade ago, um, and the fact that we are on path within a few years to be, to be a net zero importer of oil uh, doesn't change the fact that we still have enormously important strategic interests in the Middle East, doesn't change the fact that oil is still priced in a global market, and if some disruption of supply were to happen in the Middle East or political instability were to arise there, that would hit consumers at the pump in the U.S. just the same whether we import or not. And that's why even though we're importing very little now, President Trump had to stand up at the United Nations and call on OPEC producers to put more oil on the market because that still affects the price uh, here at home. So I think the whole narrative to the extent that the U.S. doesn't care about the Middle East anymore because of our shale revolution is way overstated. Uh, and I think that would be true kind of in the other direction as well. Thank you. Um, 
John, you mentioned uh, Egypt and kind of using it as a jumping off point into Africa. Um, you know, we certainly, the Middle East, I think two thirds of the world's population lives within a five hour flight of Dubai. So, you know, to what extent do you think that the region will continue to be a, a strategic linchpin for growth in emerging Africa? And then also looking to India, we haven't really talk, touched on India yet. Uh, well, India, I've, I've not uh, given much thought to, but uh, I, I certainly see the same potential in India as what we are currently seeing in Africa. Uh, which is that uh, D Dubai is and has been historically the launching pad for investment into both the Maghreb region as well as Sub-Saharan and South Africa. Um, uh, Dubai offers investors just a wealth of benefits. You have, um, you have multiple free zones. You have uh, income, t income tax free. You have a flat tax rate. Um, you, you have many different um, regions within Dubai that um, permit very low uh, corporate regulations, very uh, few corporate governance regulations, uh, the ability to be wholly foreign owned, um, wholly foreign or sole shareholder, um, limited liabilities and so on and so forth. And that has been um, something that has attracted um, a great deal of investors who are looking to enter into, distribute to, um, export into um, Africa, but who might be wary of the um, uncertainties um, in African laws or tax um, codes and so on and so forth and so have di have opted to um, to to base their headquarters not only for the GCC in the Middle East um, but the much broader region um, Europe Middle East and Africa um, right from Dubai and um, with India's growth as an economy I, I guess I could foresee that as well um, I, th I believe the last uh, numbers I've seen were roughly 88% of residents in the UAE were foreign nationals, expatriates. Um, a significant portion of, the, of, the, of them are um, from Central Asia, including uh, India, um, uh, uh, so Southern Asia, including India. And I, I think the, both of the flights and um, uh, transportation would facilitate the um, basing one's business in India uh, from Dubai. So I, I, I certainly think that would be feasible and foreseeable. Great, thank you. Sure.